It is Saturday, August the 17th, 2019. This is the Distant Peasant Podcast, and I am your host, Jeff and Georgia. On today's show, a brief history of the Second Amendment. Yes, the whole thing's only 27 words long, so let's dive deep into each one of those words and what they meant at the time and for many years until incredibly recently. But of course, before I get to all that, just a brief reminder that today's show, like all of these shows, is brought to you by listeners like you. Listeners who have gone to patreon.com slash peasant. And have become recurring donors for as little as one dollar a month to support the research and writing and audio production work that goes into this show, which is of course made by one man and his three-legged dog. So if you want to support those efforts, again, that's patreon.com slash distant peasant. There's a PayPal button at my website, distantpeasant.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Jeff His Dudeness. Thank you very much on with the show. Quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, end quote. So we'll take things narrowly, but thoroughly, step by step. So we can figure out just what the fuck they were talking about when they inserted these words in the U.S. Constitution. So in sequence, I'm going to talk a little bit about, first, that well-regulated militia. Second, the security of a free state that it's necessary to. And finally, the right of the people to keep and bear arms. What did all these concepts mean to people contemporaneously? Why were they inserted into the Constitution? Why does the law of the land currently stand in opposition to all I'm about to say? And what is my prescription of the situation? So, let me paint you a picture. Imagine two military forces. The first is a professional army, complete with uniforms, Procedures, training, wages. Now they are fighting at the far end of their supply lines, true. But due to definitive naval and logistic superiority, for the time being, anyway, they can resupply and move their troops through waterways along the coast without much difficulty, and therefore move much faster than their opponents gain. Now what's more, this imperial force is not new but the product of one of the richest and most advanced nations on the planet, widely considered to be an unstoppable tide of conquest for generations. Opposing them, the second force, the fabled citizen soldier, called away from their normal lives as farmers or shopkeeps or mechanics, they and others like them have grabbed their hunting muskets bid their families goodbye, all to defend this land from these marauding soldiers. Now, what they lack in training and professionalism, they make up for in enthusiasm and grit, the home field advantage, crack shooting abilities from years of hunting, and a zeal for liberty, freedom, and justice. Or as one poet put it at the time, quote, from a kingdom that bullies and hectors and swears, we send up to heaven our wishes and prayers that we, disunited, may free men be still, and Britain go on to be damned if she will. End quote. This is the popular story of the American War for Independence and the Associated Political Revolution. And as that contemporaneous fragment of poetry shows, it wasn't just a myth that was made up after the fact. It was one cultivated and propagated at the time. It's almost understandable, if you grant that war is a given, that it's better to go with a half-trained army of volunteers and conscripts than no army at all. So flattering those prospective volunteers and their motivations 
This is an obvious move. Now these militiamen of the soon-to-be United States were in imagination and rhetoric a universal body of all citizens, white and male of course, willing to grab a gun and fight for freedom. And they won. Not because the French really shook things up by pouring oodles of money and ships and guns into the whole cause, or because of the defensive advantages enjoyed by the colonists, no, 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 but because they were virtuous. An oppressive government once recognized as legitimate had grown tyrannical. It was therefore the duty of all who loved liberty to take up arms. But what if, horror of horrors, they had had no arms to take up? Indeed, early skirmishes with British soldiers involved who exactly controlled the gunpowder for the colonial militia's weapons. Now what if after our freedom is won, our own new government attempted to do the same and disarm this universal militia with a totalitarian government? Well, we can't have that. And that's why our wise ancestors included in the founding document of our government a provision that settles once and for all that it is the right of all free people to bear arms in order to secure their own liberty. That's all a real tidy story. It's very dangerous. And not least of all because it bears a passing resemblance to actual historical events and propaganda. Any sarcastic editorializing by yours truly accepted is less than half true. And the parts that are true are the least consequential to the ideology on display. For one thing, those colonial militiamen's most famous victories involve shooting at advancing soldiers from behind cover and occurred very early during armed hostilities. Desertions and a lack of discipline in the face of advancing British forces plagued these militiamen immediately. And by 1776, no one who had any sense, whatever fears they may have expressed about the tyranny of a standing military force, opposed the creation of a continental army. T'was this army, commanded by George Washington, that most people are at least vaguely aware of as winning the war, with of course large helpings of luck, Fabian tactics, and French assistance. What's more, it was a myth that large numbers of colonial households even owned firearms that were in working order. Even less of them hunted regularly and developed good aim. Early colonists, by and large, relied upon professional hunters and trappers, frequently indigenous Americans, for wild game meat. But the consequences of this myth and rhetoric, some of which calls back to the idealization of the Roman Republic's virtuous farmer soldiers that these men of letters were all familiar with, has bizarrely manifested. Powerful interests associated not with loving freedom, but loving gold, have reintroduced these myths hundreds of years later, long after it seemed the vast majority of judges, lawyers, and politicians had accepted as settled that the war-era propaganda that was flattering of militias was exactly that. We should not be bound by the past, in any case, but neither should we lie to ourselves or each other about it, especially when it does come to words that are set down in our highest laws of the land. The Second Amendment to the United States Constitution, whatever flowery rhetoric has been preserved about the common citizen soldier fighting for nothing but their own peace and liberty against a tyrannical government, was never about preserving the right to armed insurrection against an intolerable government. Everyone who debated those amendments was aware of how poorly the militias had actually performed in the war and how vital the creation of a continental army had been. There is no reason we need to comically imagine today's Bubba and his gun club buddies standing up to the United States Department of Defense's full might and power to demolish the utility of the theory of a right to insurrection. Even with 18th century technology and organization, your well-armed American citizen soldier was no match for a professional British infantry. And anyone who knew anything about the war for independence at the time knew that. That includes everyone who voted on these amendments to the Constitution. No, like every other question concerning how to organize the new nation's government, the stench of slavery surrounds these words in the Second Amendment. 
and it is this issue more than any other that the amendment concerns. So, if the militia at the time wasn't any good at fighting wars, what was it good for? The security of a free state. What does that, does that mean? Well, it means basically operating as the last and best defense for slave rebellions. To illustrate this, let's talk about Virginia in June 1788. Now, of course, the war for independence has long been won. The Articles of Confederation adopted, subsequently revealed to be unworkable. The Constitution has been debated, written, voted upon by the convention delegates, proposed to the states. The Constitution itself stated that when nine of the 13 colonies ratified the Constitution, it became law, a fact that not everyone agreed with should be noted. Why should a document that binds all states not be adopted by all states? Nonetheless, eight states had already voted in the affirmative, though crucially, New York and Virginia remained outside of the Union. In particular, without Virginia, there would be no Union. Our first president was basically already picked and was from there. It was an incredibly wealthy colony. It occupied the middle of the eastern seaboard. If Virginia had remained outside the Union, it is likely the other southern states would have followed suit. And the nation split 80 years sooner than it did. For opponents of the Constitution, called anti-federalists at the time, if you'll recall, this was their last, best chance to stop the Constitution from being adopted and the United States being created. Now, at a quirk of history... New Hampshire would ratify the Constitution four days before Virginia did. But because of Virginia's importance as a colony and because information can only travel about as fast as a horse can gallop or a ship can sail in 1788, nobody voting in Virginia gave a shit about that. Leading the opposition in Richmond were Patrick Henry and George Mason. Henry probably the more useful of the two for our purposes here. You see, Patrick Henry was getting a bit long in the tooth. He was long past his prime and had a bit of a rambling tendency to him. But this combined with the increasingly slim chances of his side prevailing in the vote would lead him to spell out things that ordinarily wouldn't have been spelled out, even in a political discussion as frank as this. James Madison, the guy who will be drafting the Second Amendment and all the amendments when it comes time to put him to a vote for the Bill of Rights, whose prints are all over the Constitution, is really the chief big baller trying to get this passed. So when Patrick Henry brought up militias, it was absolutely clear what the primary purposes of that militia were. The last, best defense against slave rebellion, as well as a source in some states of enforcing the police state required by a slave society. When a Federalist answered Mason's proposal of a constitutional movement that would prevent the federal government from marching a state's militia beyond its borders, they remarked that it would be the southern states most likely hurt by such a provision, given that they were most likely to need to muster a militia. Left unspoken was any mention of slavery and why they'd need that militia. It wasn't polite. In fact, at the Constitutional Convention a year earlier, one delegate had brought up the reverse concern, that the North would be unfairly burdened by the South's slave economy because they would be bound to help suppress any insurrections. Now, we on the left often take it for granted that the American Revolution was barely a revolution at all, really. It's a rhetoric about freedom and liberty. It ended up being so narrow as to be meaningless in practice for huge numbers of people. It's all just a cynical exercise by one segment of the ruling class against another. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot to that. The revolutionaries were a pretty conservative lot. With Thomas Paine being far and away the most sincere, committed, and brilliant character we could possibly call an American revolutionary. But Paine was no delegate to any constitutional conventions or any politician of any kind precisely for that reason. All this being said... The contradiction between the revolution's rhetoric and the existence of slavery was not universally ignored. Where accepted, it was often with qualification and embarrassment. At the very least, it was an incredibly delicate subject, 
But Patrick Henry, older now, irascible, and during the final days of the Virginia Convention, increasingly desperate to stop Madison's momentum, finally fucking did it. The U.S. Constitution, despite dealing with slavery several times, never uses the word directly until the 13th Amendment. Debates that reference it are always oblique or indirect. Some historians even speculate that during debates on this topic, the participants kept shitty or no records at all on purpose for this reason. Even among a white audience of free and proper Virginians in 1788, this was something raised in private, if at all, not in public. But Patrick Henry fucking did it. Way to go, buddy. Thank you very much for saying the quiet part loud. Quote, in this state... There are 236,000 blacks, and there are many in several other states, but there are few or none in the northern states, end quote, he said. He went on to note that the Constitution gave Congress the power to provide for the general defense. What if they wanted to conscript black people? Quote, they will search that paper and see if they have the power of manumission. And have they not, sir? Have they not power to provide for the general defense and welfare? May they not think that these call for the abolition of slavery? May they not pronounce all slaves free? And will they not be warranted by that power? This is no ambiguous implication or logical deduction. The paper speaks to the point. They have the power in clear, unequivocal terms, and will clearly and certainly exercise it. End quote. This argument was absolutely shocking at the time, made as it was in such direct terms. It took Madison a bit to recover before he could answer. And he argued that the paper said no such thing, persuasively enough that his side did carry the day. But it also reflected in heightened Southern anxiety over slavery at the time, which is an important ingredient in understanding politics. When you're on top of a brutal and violent system, reciprocity haunts your mind. By the security of a free state, they did not mean the threat of foreign invasion, the militias having proven themselves no match for professional soldiers, and the creation of the U.S. Army a foregone conclusion. They meant domestic threats, which almost always meant slave rebellion. And with the adoption of a new system of government, they were concerned that any efforts to moderate their control over slaves would mean their brutal murder. And what's more, they knew that not all people of the North were feeling good about all these compromises with Southern slavers, including the elected officials who reluctantly signed on. One more thing on the free state of Virginia. It did ratify the Constitution without condition, immediately appointed a committee to draft proposed constitutional amendments the Bill of Rights for subsequent adoption. Within these proposed amendments are actually a bunch of changes that would have recognized the individual right to bear arms and resist tyrannical governments. Some of them banned any standing armies at all. Others limited the federal government's ability to govern state militias. None of them end up in the Constitution, of course, tellingly, but they all passed the Virginia Convention unanimously leading some to perhaps suppose that they were uncontroversial and universally accepted political ideas. They were not. You see, having defeated your enemies in a close vote, it makes sense to give them the power of drafting proposed changes that no one is under any obligation to enact. A cathartic exercise for the defeated, not an accurate representation of any thought that carried the day. Nonetheless, Madison was a marked man by some in Virginia now. Do you know he nearly didn't even make it into Congress to propose any Bill of Rights at all, including the Second Amendment? Patrick Henry saw that two anti-federalist senators were installed from Virginia and then attempted to gerrymander the shit out of Madison's house. Madison, faced with opponent James Monroe's campaign as a vigorously supported Bill of Rights candidate, he felt he had no choice but to commit to the idea politically, whatever reservations he had previously expressed about enumerating rights in the Constitution. 
versus including structural checks and balances as the best way to forge a government in his view. He probably wouldn't have won election if he hadn't. So the man who made the list of amendments to vote on started combing through the hundreds of proposed changes to the Constitution. Concerning arms, only four state constitutions at the time mentioned a right to bear arms, and it was a 2v2 split on whether this was a collective or individual right. Now, Madison himself didn't give much of a shit about this right compared to others, so all in all, it's doubtful he would have even bothered to put it in the Constitution if it wasn't for what happened in Virginia. Some of the proposed amendments mentioned militia for defense. We didn't go with that. We went with the word security. Consistent with the purpose to mollify southern states' concerns that the federal government would interfere with their slave populations. The records of debate on all this in the House and Senate are more or less non-existent. And even where they do exist, focus far more on other amendments anyway. But ask yourself a simple question. Which do you think the white people of the slave-based society in the South of the United States were more concerned with? Abstract debates on the nature of liberty, tyranny, and the right to take up arms against it? Or the possibility of losing effective control of their very real and very present slave population and facing justice at the hands of those same slaves. If you prefer abstraction, ask yourself a further question. If freedom is difficult to precisely define, is it not easier to measure it against its opposite and define it by its negative? We are forever a free people, which means not like our slaves. And defining ourselves as forever armed in defense of that endeavor and the U.S. Constitution, that's part of the bargain. Finally, what about this right to keep and bear arms at the time not being infringed? Well, you see, the, the Americans didn't come up with all this on their own. They borrowed it from something called the Declaration of Rights of 1689. It's from jolly old England, of course. You see, a delegation from England offering the crown to William of Orange and his Queen Mary after the hated Catholic King James had fled for France negotiated this declaration between the two parties. And one thing it mentions, is among all the crap the old king had done, was to try to disarm Protestants, notwithstanding Parliament's laws about who could have weapons, what kind, how many, under what conditions, etc. In other words, the whole problem was that the king was infringing upon the rights of Parliament, not that the state was infringing upon the rights of the people. The provision in the relevant document is short enough and reads, quote, that the subjects which are Protestants may have clear arms for their defense suitable to their condition and as allowed by law, end quote making it actually pretty clear what they meant. In the same vein, Madison, who wrote the Second Amendment's words and was a huge fan of structural checks and the mechanisms of government, was seeking to transfer the authority to form and arm a militia from a body then held in suspicion, the Federal Congress, to a more trusted body, the states. Now, all that being said, let's just imagine together for a moment that everything I've said about what happened is total bullshit. Let's say that Patrick Henry didn't say that shit, or if he did, no one agreed with him, and that the Second Amendment has nothing to do with slaves or the fear of slave rebellion, and really does instead enshrine a right to resistance, a right to rebel, a right to enter a state of insurrection against a government that's become tyrannical in order to secure the existence of a free people in a free state. So let's tease this out on a really basic level. Who will decide when freedom is gone and tyranny reigns? We can't decide this question via election and a representative democracy because those are controlled by the alleged tyrants. If a right to insurrect against the tyrannical machinations of a government exists, the only party capable of deciding that it's time to go to war will be the warriors themselves. If this were really the case today, frankly... Would it really result in anything more than a right to suicide by cop, in most cases? 
If the right to insurrection really had been on anyone's mind in America, why did they not speak up when war veteran Daniel Shays took up arms against the tyrannical courts and government that were oppressing him and his comrades? With the sole exception of Thomas Jefferson far across the sea in Paris, in a letter that was definitely and consciously not addressed to any American politician at the time. Why did the Americans instead brutally crush his uprising? If that really was what this was all about. Well, because that's not what this was really all about, and never has been. The legislative and judicial history of cases and laws relating to the Second Amendment is incredibly sparse, until very recently in the nation's history. The Second Amendment was more or less a constitutional relic both before and after the Civil War, and Reconstruction era constitutional and political changes for many, many decades, among judges, attorneys, and scholars, all. Even after the National Rifle Association was taken over by political reactionaries in the late 1970s, challenges to our nation's meager federal firearm legislation studiously avoided any arguments relying upon the Second Amendment. Challenges to the Brady Bill, for example, in the Supreme Court were made exclusively on Tenth Amendment grounds. It was just accepted that as the Constitution gives Congress the power to organize the militia in Article 1, Section 8, the right to bear arms refer to the collective right to carry arms in service of the state. Never an individual right to possess a weapon. But in politics, and forgive me if you don't think the law is distinct from politics, ideas lose and lose and lose and lose and lose until very suddenly they don't, and it takes but one victory to prove the pudding. In addition to manufacturing fear on behalf of weapons manufacturers, producing nationalist propaganda, and funneling money into allegedly legally dubious political activities, and just generally making the world a worse place, the NRA, among other actors, spent decades and many, many dollars cultivating insurrectionist theory. In this appendix of our system, the Second Amendment has burst asunder. From non-existent school of thought to laughing stocks of academia to a small and radical band of article-churning true believers to finally a respectable enough school of thought to convert five of nine justices on the Supreme Court in 2008 in a decision jarring enough to the other justices that actually two separate dissenting opinions were written, both signed by all four of them, finally recognized an individual right to a firearm. The decision was so monumental and frankly unexpected that the NRA itself had actually fought hard for the case not to be heard in court, sure as they were of an unfavorable decision. Now, I know the Second Amendment is not the fundamental reason the United States doesn't have effective gun control legislation on a federal level. It's just the thing they point to. I know that's kind of a weird thing to say after all the picking through it I've done, but my purpose is in doing so. I've just to point out how easy it is to understand what was playing to not just people at the time, but people for generations and generations. The Second Amendment was part of the slavery bargain, full stop, and never had anything to do with the right to armed rebellion. I've given the context, I've read a few quotes, and honestly, because they were such shitty note-takers, the fact that we have even the moderate evidence that we do should really make this essentially unarguable in any other way. The Second Amendment hasn't changed since it was written, so why are there so many highly respected and wealthy people, including the majority of the highest court in the nation, that don't agree with me? Well, just taking a stab at it, what changed in that time was the world and its people. Rapidly increasing income inequality and the unpopularity of the right wing's economic vision of endlessly squeezing profit from the bodies of the working class has meant that they've had to become increasingly creative and varied in actualizing their voting base. Religion, abortion, race, sexuality and gender, immigration, and yes, guns. These are all buttons they have to mash increasingly hard and often to stay in power as they funnel more and more wealth to the top. 
Ironically, the identity politics they accuse the left of playing is what they themselves rely upon more and more to, quote, win elections. And that's with huge quotes around the word win. And the identity of rugged warrior, heroic citizen soldier struggling against a corrupt power structure is incredibly alluring. And it has been since literally before the United States was a thing. It's no coincidence that insurrectionist legal theory gathered steam at the same time movies like Rambo First Blood and the Death Wish franchise were in the zeitgeist. And honestly, if the Second Amendment really has become a ruptured appendix in our political system, as I called it before, there is nothing to do for that but to remove or neutralize the offending organ. Thank you for listening. I know it's a little bit of a downer note to go out on. But every time there's a mass shooting, I think about this issue. I think about the sort of a clownish vision of society and history that the right wing has of America and how it has metastasized into something truly despicable and heartbreaking when dozens of people can be gunned down at any time for literally no reason or bad reasons and there's just nothing that we can do about it because the second amendment well fuck that so now you know why fuck that patreon.com slash distant peasant distant peasant.com as always follow me on twitter at jeffisdunis 